an old book, a book about witchcraft. You're listening to the Whitewood Podcast, a show about mystery schools, the occult, and witchcraft. Would you like to have a look around? Why have you come to Whitewood? Well, because I'm interested in witchcraft. I'm your host, Nate. Come with us as we delve into the history, techniques, and backstories of these traditions and the people who practice them. Welcome back to the Whitewood Podcast. My name is Nate Driscoll. I'm your host, and this week we are going to be diving into the topic that is lucid dreaming. Um, Lucid dreaming is a topic that I have been extremely interested and passionate about. I've definitely had a lot of my own personal experiences, uh, spent a lot of time researching some of the history and techniques that have worked for others and figuring out what kinds of techniques work for myself. So um, that being said, there's a lot of information here because it is something that I've been so fascinatedly interested in. And so um, this topic is going to be a multi-episode topic. We're going to dive into some of the specifics that have to do with um, dreams themselves, as well as uh, some of the history of lucid dreaming, some of the different sleep states that, it, that exist. And then hopefully we'll get into a really cool place when we talk about once you start lucid dreaming, how can you incorporate that into an occult practice? And what does that look like? Um, so without, without too much ado, um, I think that it's important to define what dreaming is. What is dreaming? Well, I think that most people have had experiences with dreaming. There are a few disabilities that would prevent an individual from having dreams. They're very rare. Um, most people do not have them. However, I will say a lot of people don't remember their dreams. Um, if you're one of those people who doesn't remember your dreams and hasn't been formally diagnosed with anything that would prevent you from dreaming, I would most definitely consider the possibility that you're dreaming every single night, multiple times a night, and that you are uh, simply one of the people who, um, like most of the population, is forgetting them by the time you wake up or forgetting them in the moments of waking up as your brain comes back into its uh, fully alert stage, fully alert uh, wavelengths. So um, I definitely think that it's something that most people do. Um, I would say everyone, if it weren't for those small percentages of disability based lacks of dreaming. Um, you can have injuries to, uh, to the head that also stop an individual from dreaming. Those, again, extremely rare. And it's much more likely that if you find yourself not dreaming that you're just forgetting them. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about in these episodes is how to remember those dreams. What to do once you wake up that would assist in you know, rebuilding that bridge of information. So, um, what is my personal, well, what is a dream? A dream is the uh, hallucinatory narratives that happen when you are asleep. Basically, uh, you enter certain stages of sleep throughout the night where your brain starts to have some pretty random and chaotic behaviors that we don't fully understand the purpose of, but we have some theories as to what it's for. We think it might have to do with um, predatory practices um, because we are meat eaters biologically. Um, it seems scientifically that uh, most of the animals, if not all the animals, that uh, are capable of dreaming are the ones who are meat eaters in some aspect. It seems to be some form of um, simulation that the mind can go through in order to have creative problem solving more quickly in the moment. And so some of the theory is that these hallucinatory states 
these visions that you have when you go to sleep are your brain trying out impossible and strange scenarios so that when you're awake and your life is dependent on that next meal and you're chasing a, I don't know, a wildebeest, a deer, or whatever the thing is that your predator mind is chasing, if it zigzags left around a rock, you already kind of have some neurons that are built up for the pattern of immediately reacting to that. Uh, so it kind of helps you to uh, be less stuck in your own ways and be a little bit more creative in your, re in your instant reactions. That's one of the major reasons we think that it happens. Some of the other theories have to do with uh, processing information of the night before, uh, or I'm sorry, of the day before. Um, it, there's some potentials that uh, the process exists as a way of um, testing out neural pathways in order to see which of them uh, connect to each other, finding new ways for the brain to connect ideas together. And, um, and then there's, of course, the uh, question that gets posed by a lot of spiritual communities is, is if the nature of dreaming is in itself a spiritual consequence as opposed to a scientific consequence. And that's difficult to say for sure, because it sure does seem as if uh, everything that can dream is uh, a predator of some kind. We see it a lot in meat-eating animals. We, we don't really see a lot of dreaming in uh, like, uh, you know, like sheep, for example, or like uh, deer. We don't see dreaming in those kind of animals. But we most definitely see it in like big cats or uh, human beings, which are, you know, primates. We see it in, in primates. So, um, a lot of those kind of things come into play when we're talking about dreaming. Um, well, as far as um, what happens when you dream, basically you uh, go to sleep, you go through several stages of sleep where your brain goes through certain types of patterns of activity. And throughout different stages in the night, you'll be in different patterns of activity. And uh, you'll cycle through those actually several times. And during one of those cycles, uh, you have what's called REM sleep or REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. And basically, there's a point in the night where your body releases a compound that kind of paralyzes you, which is really, really important if you're going to dream that you, uh, that you need to be paralyzed because if you are having a dream about a tiger chasing you but you're like you know sleeping in the woods uh running around and reacting physically to that tiger that you're dreaming about is not very beneficial you know it um could lead you into running off a cliff or smacking into a tree or stumbling over rocks or the kinds of things that could hurt you and especially when we're talking about the evolution of things we're talking about very 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 long processes that uh, include a survival of uh, a species over, you know, millennia as it shifts from one species to another. And uh, that being said, we're talking significantly before human beings. And uh, it's something as simple as a broken leg it is a death sentence in the animal kingdom. So uh, you can imagine how that might be a really big deal that you're not running around and breaking bones and uh, those kind of things while you're having those hallucinatory states. Um, so while this is happening, uh, you have what is called a class five hallucinatory state. So there's different uh, levels to what kinds of uh, hallucinations you can have. Um, a class, f or I'm sorry, you're in a class, is it a, f well, I suppose it would be a four to five, depending on what point throughout the night and what point in the dream. Um, basically, a, a class four is that you are yourself, but you are completely immersed in whatever uh, experience you are um, experiencing, right? So like a class one to two, you're like aware that there are some elements that are um, unreal. What, once you get to a class four, it just is your reality, whatever whatever uh, you're experiencing is 
you're totally immersed in that. And then a class five, you might not be um, tied into the concept of yourself. That's kind of the separation there. And throughout dreams, we do kind of uh, drift in between a, a class four and a class five hallucinatory state where um, uh, basically uh, you're completely immersed in the narrative that is being presented to you. And sometimes you are so immersed in the narrative that you cease to associate yourself with the identity of whatever character it is that you're playing uh, in that dream. Um, many things in the dreamscape uh, can be very weird. They don't, it doesn't follow normal rules. Um, I like to refer to it as ideas being liquids um, in the way that ideas, concepts, nouns um, can flow into each other and sort of mix the way that if you had like a cup of red dye and a cup of blue dye and you poured them both into a pool, you can definitely see a cloud of blue and a cloud of red, but there's going to be the, especially the longer those two things sit next to each other and the more action there is between them because the pool is being stirred around or whatever, you're going to see some intermingling of the red cloud and the blue cloud of ink and they're going to eventually merge and become a purple cloud of ink um, with enough time and agitation and even just sitting between those two clouds, you're going to find that ideas kind of merge together. So when we're talking about dreams, this can happen uh, with a lot of different things within the dreaming um, scape, where um, you might uh, find that you set an object down and it uh, kind of melds with the idea that is the table. Or um, maybe there's a narrative where you're listening to someone talk and they tell you a story and your experience before they started telling you a story was that you were in this one specific type of room. Let's say you're in a log cabin, right? And you're like hearing them talk about being downtown and you start to follow their story and the, uh, the, the layer, the barrier between their story and your surroundings start to blur and mesh together the way that two liquids might. And um, suddenly the log cabin starts to be downtown. Maybe one side of the, the building is an entrance to downtown. And so you'll find that things are very weird and kooky and difficult to really pin down uh, because ideas, identities, narratives, locations are constantly flowing together, merging uh, and uh, bubbling up as new things. Um, this happens especially the less that you're paying attention to a thing. So if I were to set down an object in my dream, a glass of water, set it down on the table, I turn, I look away from it, I talk to someone else, I turn back, my brain might fill in, oh man, there was a drink on the table or something, I don't know, put a Pepsi there. It'll make split second decisions in order to reset it. And then, and then maybe if I turn away and I turn back, it might have become orange juice because I'm not really paying attention to what the drink is. It's just kind of existing in this quasi state of, I don't know, put a drink on the table. It's some kind of a drink and it's in some kind of a container. Whereas if I sit and I interact with the, the, the cup of liquid, it will probably stay basically what it was in less uh, otherwise influenced um, by surrounding ideas. So... Uh, the nature of dreams is very liquidy in my mind, uh, constantly merging and meshing, and, but it's also kind of quantum-y in the way that uh, things that are not being observed will shift into other things. It's very quantum-like space, uh, and that's where you get some of the weirdness. Now, I've noticed that uh, television has a really difficult time trying to portray a dream state. Usually, what they opt for is just silliness. So they'll say like, yeah, and then you left your bedroom and rode on a banana to get to work. And then, you know, it's, uh, they just take one idea and implant something else. But I find that actual dreams are very difficult because uh, of that quantum liquidy behavior. That the weirdness is much more that one idea is becoming another idea because it's sitting right next to or uh, 
you know, interacting with that other idea. So that, that tends to be some of the weirdness in a more defined space. Um, within dreams, there's not a lot of the rules that exist with uh, physical reality when it comes to like mathematics, uh, Euclidean geometry, um, the, the things that uh, we would consider to make reality consistent. So like, for example, there was one time where I was looking at my hand and I counted the number of fingers on my hand within a dream. And I had more than five fingers, but less than six fingers. And I tried to explain that to a friend later because we were uh, working on, you know, we were doing some dream workshops and learning more about how dreams will function. And he had, a, he struggled with that a little bit until we kind of got to uh, a conclusion from my own experiences and then his experiences later um, that numbers don't really have to be, um, because things are very quantum -y, numbers don't have to be specific. Your, your mind might take some liberties of just like, I don't know, it's about five, maybe six. It's, I don't know, it's like five or six and input that many items. And so when you look at the object and let's say it's your fingers again, you might have probably about five fingers, but then maybe it also might be six because your brain really hasn't paid attention to how many fingers you have. Uh, and so you might have like a sixth finger that's kind of like phasing in and out of reality as you pay attention to it. And uh, it's kind of a difficult detail for your brain to, to put in there. So you'll find that um, things exist in this weird... Uh, it's a it's a Pandora's box of uh, Schrodinger's is it is it not kind of uh, uh, strangeness and um, generally speaking almost all of the time there are a couple of things that are true about dreams number one there's almost always a narrative it, it is incredibly rare for there not to be some form of a story happening within your dream some set of events and you're navigating through those events nearly all of the time and this is a really important detail because it's it it tells you a lot about how the human mind functions because as we go down into the dreaming state we're seeing a lot more of uh, a very deep and primal and subconscious level the interworkings of the mind and so if we if we recognize that the interworkings of the mind are almost always wrapped around a narrative or story that I did this, then I did this, then I did this, and these are how these ideas mesh together, uh, you find that that might be a very important facet of human consciousness. So it's fascinating that there's something like that uh, that is part of it. In fact, it, when you start to lucid dream and you start to try to end the narrative, you, you will often find that's a very complicated and difficult thing to do, which very often leads to waking because human consciousness is so intertwined with the idea of creating a narrative in a lot of ways you are a narrative that you have created from your own uh, independent moments so it's uh it, it it definitely leads to some deep questions as to why is there always a narrative the other thing that it, there is almost always um there has been some research done towards uh the contents of the dream and they have found that more frequently than not, it is almost always a narrative. That's that's an almost always. This one is like more of a more frequently than not. It's 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 uh it's it's a lower percent than the narrative concept, but it's definitely still a majority of your dreams are going to include a conflict of some kind. It's going to be an emotional conflict. It's going to be a physical conflict. It's going to be a narrative of. You know, and, and I had to do this thing, um, which leads us more into this, uh, this concept of like, why does the human mind naturally find these patterns when feasibly, uh, dreams are a lot of random, a lot of, uh, just random areas of the brain firing. Um, it's a very interesting, uh, study when it comes to dreaming and consciousness. So that kind of gives you an idea of what dreaming is. You know, it is uh, during during your sleep, so long as uh, you don't have certain types of disabilities, it is a, uh, you enter a REM cycle, 
your uh, brain starts having a pretty massive hallucination. There's a narrative, there's often a conflict, and uh, you are led through um, some fantastical, impossible uh, scenario that uh, sometimes becomes much weirder than others, and most definitely does not abide by the laws of physics as we understand them. That's kind of what happens, right? Um, but as far as, you know, historically, what have people felt about dreams? What has been documented about dreams? When did they, you know, first become a major talking point? I don't think that we'll ever truly know how long people have been interested in dreams. Um, it's a foundational part of sleep and uh, you sleep every night and it is a biological process that has happened since long, long, long before uh, you became a human being. Much farther down the evolutionary track, uh, dreaming pops up. So it's possible that people have been talking about their dreams since there have been people. Um, I would I would wager a strong bet that uh, especially cultures that are less um, uh, scientifically educated are going to find a deep fascination with dreams because it's such a fantastical experience that without some of the scientific framework in order to break it down and understand what just happened, it might appear as if you are having visions or some form of a mystical experience. Now, by all means, I don't necessarily mean that just because you think that uh, things are scientific that you can't also be having a mystical experience. Obviously, on this podcast, we highly support the idea that there are some things that are of the mystic uh, by its very nature. And I would argue that dreams are a major component of that. But my point is that if you had no understanding of what dreams are, and you lived in a primitive society, you would be much more prone to associate those things uh, with some form of divine mystical experience. Um, so the practice of recording one's dreams seems to go back pretty far. We know that the ancient Romans had a tradition of dream interpretation that they stole from the Greeks, as they stole many things from the Greeks. Um, so it, it was written at one point that Augustus who is the successor of Julius Caesar, so Augustus Caesar. That's where we get the months uh, August and July. Augustus, Julius, yeah, August and July were added to the uh, calendar to celebrate those two. It's one of the reasons why all the months are different lengths. It's also one of the reasons why everything other than August and July is numbered. So like des, ember, is dec, right? Decimal, de you know, it's 10. Right, it's the tenth month, oct ober, oct eight, octopus. Right, uh, so before uh, adding August and July, uh, Augustus and Julius, uh, we're, we're living in a, a ten month calendar, <laughs> and uh, the the months were properly numbered, and then they added July and August. So those are who I mean, we're talking quite a while ago. Um, Augustus was said to believe so strongly in the prophecy that is dreams that there was a law requiring every citizen who had any dream about the empire whatsoever to come to the market in town and talk about it. So like if you had any kind of, so you have a dream about Rome, you are required by law to go downtown get surrounded by everybody and be like, hey, guys, I had a dream about Rome. And for that interpretation to be, you know, something that people were making decisions about. Um, I think that's a really interesting concept of, you know, the importance that dreaming had for these individuals. Um, in Greek mythology, um, there were sometimes personified dreams. It's not often, it's not all the time. Uh, very often dreams are just dreams. But there were times where they personified just about everything, and dreams is no different. So when they were personified dreams, uh, they were the Oniros. Um, we now use that word to refer to lucid dreaming 
uh, lucid dreamers, an oniro not, an oniro meaning um, dream not meaning explore. So he who, you know, travels through his dreams is a, an, on, an oniro not. So the oniros or the oniro uh, were personified dreams that were the sons of uh, Nyx and Hypnos. Uh, Nyx is uh, night, personified night, and Hypnos is personified sleep. And that kind of makes sense that sleep and nighttime mix together and make, you know, dreams, which uh, I will say I dream more at night than when I do when I take a nap during the day. Now, I still will dream sometimes during the day, but uh, it's an interesting observation that they made that it is this marriage of, you know, the personification of night and the personification of sleep. Um, also in the Greeks, uh, Hippocrates, the, uh, the, um, what is it? He, he, the f He's kind of like the father figure of medicine. He, um, he was the first to like really try to treat patients and identify, um, identify the problems of the body, the problems of illness to be something that you can solve like a puzzle. You can identify the cause, resolve the cause, and thus heal an individual. At one point, he wasn't even allowed in like town because they thought he was a witch. Um, but he was where we would most likely consider the, uh, the beginning of medicine because he's the first person documented at least to be, uh, you know, like treating patients and, and attempting to, you know, instead of saying the gods are upset to say, I don't think the gods are upset. I think that this man drank some dirty water and it had, you know, this in it and we should give him this. And his, uh, his treatments are all over the place. Some of them are kind of, a, you know, Hey, that might work. And some of them are absolutely batshit crazy. Uh, but he's the first to, you know, start that process of, uh, many would consider him to be the first doctor. So, uh, he believed that we receive spiritual signals, uh, in the day while we're going about our life. And then at night we take those spiritual signals and turn them into images. And it's an interesting point that he pointed out because it is very common that, uh, a theme that you encounter during the day will uh, find itself worked into your dream. So if you spend a lot of time thinking about something, um, working with some idea, it's very common that it shows up in your dreams. So I think there might be something to some of what he said uh, when he's talking about receiving something during the day and it being produced into images at night. I think he might be very correct uh, in that some of the stuff that happens to you during the day can be incorporated into the symbols and ideas that are used in your sleep. Um, and this is why we have what's called the Tetris effect. There's, uh, I believe Tetris was the first time that we, I know that it's named after that, but I, I believe it was the first time that we had really observed it. But there's this effect. If you uh, play too much Tetris, it really, any video game, any form of media, it will happen. But, um, because Tetris is a fast enough paced game with a simple enough pattern and you kind of just go through certain types of motions and pattern recognition really quickly. If you play too much Tetris, you will dream Tetris levels. This is absolutely a real documented thing. And I have a friend who had it happen to him where he was getting really, really into Tetris. And he said the next morning, he, he, this is before I had really told him about the Tetris effect. He said, yeah, I, uh, I dreamed about Tetris all night. And I was like, yeah, that's a documented thing. Basically, uh, if you do nothing but one thing for a day, it's much more likely to be the framework for the next night's dream. So, uh, there's probably something to Hippocrates' uh, concept of uh, something during the day being produced in images at night. There's probably something to that. And that might be a process of interpretation. It might be a process of... Um, I don't know, it could be a lot of things. It could be a, a process of like forming memories and those kind of things. Although we think that memories are formed in a slightly different process in the sleep, which we will get to in a moment. 
Um, and then it, there's also been long traditions in uh, Eastern cultures, as really every culture in the world, but Eastern cultures in specific, going back as far as 1000 BCE. Um, the Hindus have a practice of yoga nidra, uh, which is not entirely a dreaming practice, but can include some aspects that um, that uh, include some guided meditations into lucid states. Now, specifically with Yoga Nidra, it is my personal interpretation that they are not exploring lucid dreaming, but they are exploring uh, lucid uh, hypnagogic uh, vision. Now, we'll get kind of into the specifics of what hypnagogic is, but there's actually more than one hallucinatory state that you experience when you're sleeping. Uh, one of them is much closer to your consciousness than the other. What we would consider to be a lucid dream is much farther away from your uh, normal waking consciousness than your hypnagogic, which is much, uh, much closer to a waking state. And we'll talk about some of that separation in just a moment. So um, that's some of the history of dreams. And I find it fascinating. There's always more to learn about the history of dreaming and dream states and every culture has their own experiences with it. And uh, those were just some of the first ones that came to mind as we were making the episodes. So definitely don't think that's a, a list that has, uh, you know, complete, even, even just in the Greek concept, there's a whole bunch more information. So don't feel like we have completely tackled the topic. So that kind of gives you a brief history of dreams. But what is lucid dreaming? So lucid dreaming is the practice of being alert and aware that you are dreaming while you're dreaming. So lucidity is kind of a word that, you know, describes being mentally alert and aware uh, to be actively participating in whatever experience you're currently in, right? So, uh, for example, my grandmother had um, slipped into some dementia at the end of her life, and there were most of the time she was not lucid. She was just kind of going along the flow of whatever she was experiencing. And then every once in a while she would become lucid. She would be aware that she was uh, alive and in the room and who she was and where she was. And she would have conversations with us. And uh, then she would slip back into that state of uh, kind of just being lost in it. And, um, the same way that an individual with dementia can slip in and out of uh, lucidity and clarity, um, people can do that within their dreams, where normally you're just kind of along for the narrative, just kind of along for the ride, but in using certain techniques, or sometimes there are people who have it happen normally, or sometimes there's people who have it happen normally once, and then, uh, you know, many years later, learn a little bit more about it and start doing techniques. There's a whole bunch of different ways that can happen. It can happen organically and it can happen. Uh, it, it definitely happens much more frequently if you, uh, if you actively practice it. And there are even some people who just naturally lucid dream more regularly than others. Um, but the idea is basically that uh, you're dreaming. You become awake and alert to the idea that you are dreaming. And the dream kind of changes a little bit because of it because you are in a state of experiencing a reality that is being built actively by your brain while you're experiencing that reality. Um, being aware that it's happening means that you can kind of influence what happens. You can do a lot more. And then your only limitations are no longer whatever the narrative is. Your limitation is whatever you can imagine because you can input imagination directly into the reality that you are experiencing at the time, which in this case is the dream world. So uh, basically, you're sleeping, you're dreaming, you wake up to the idea that you are dreaming, and now you're in control of the reality you're experiencing, which is that dream. So um, that's what lucid dreaming is. It's, it's the, uh, the uh, action of that happening. As far as lucidity itself, there's actually a ton of different layers of lucidity. It's much more of a spectrum. I'm sure you could find yourself at any point on that line. Let's say that uh, it's 
uh, zero to five. You could you could break it down that way. You could break it down zero to ten, but um, well, let's say one to five. Let's say one to five. So one would be uh, I'm one hundred percent not aware that I'm dreaming. It is I am a hundred percent lost within the dream. There is no inkling in my mind that this is anything other than my actual reality. That would be one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is I am 100% aware that I am dreaming and completely in control. And with lucidity, it's much more of a spectrum. You would think those are the only two options, but it's not. It's definitely not how it happens. And uh, you might find yourself at like a, like a two where you're like, hmm, this is kind of a strange experience. Or a three where you're like, man, I'm dreaming, but I'm also very lost in this narrative. So I'm kind of aware that it's a dream narrative, but I'm not really in control of everything right now. Or a four where I'm kind of slipping in between being lucid and not being lucid. And there's like a little bit of a, a juggling act of trying to keep myself aware and alert of my surroundings. And then back up to that five where I am 100% aware that I'm a dream. I am completely awake and alert and uh, able to even take time, stop my dream body in a random hallway and observe the surroundings and look around and control my conversations and those kind of things. So it's, there's, there's different layers to it. And you'll find throughout dreaming and lucid dreaming that you ebb and flow back and forth into all five of those different states. And of course, like I said, it is a spectrum. So by no means could you not break it down farther and um, have a larger spectrum, but I would definitely have at least five levels of understanding. There is kind of a variance there that it's not always just you're, you're turned off or you're turned on. There's a lot more of like a, uh, I'm partially awake and alert moments. Um, so yeah, uh, and I'll, some of the techniques that we'll talk about are gonna talk about how to take yourself from one of those states to another one. Generally speaking, what we would like to do is take ourselves and uh, get higher up in lucidity, not lower down in lucidity, but I suppose you could uh, you could do the opposite if you really wanted to, um, if you were uncomfortable for some reason, I guess. Although if you were uncomfortable, I would just suggest waking up, and writing down what just happened. But uh, yeah, so, so that's what lucidity is. That's what lucid dreaming is, being aware of it. But why would you want to lucid dream? This is the point that I have been stuck at trying to answer for everyone around me for so long that it's becoming frustrating. Why wouldn't you want to lucid dream? Everything that you want is behind that door. When, no matter what you want, no matter what kind of a person you are, if you're hedonistic, you have the ultimate pleasures behind that door. If you're spiritual, there's uh, delving into symbolism and the divine behind that door. If you're just curious and pragmatic, there's an exploration of you know, your own psyche, your own subconscious, your own mind in a very pragmatic way. It doesn't matter what you are looking for and what you are seeking. Behind the door that is lucid dreaming is the thing. And that's why it blows my mind that everyone is not obsessed with lucid dreaming all of the time. I think there should be a mass cultural revival of interest in lucid dreaming for some reason. We think of it as like a taboo topic to talk around the office and it just doesn't seem to uh, excite people. Now, I know what you're thinking. Nate, that's a pretty bold claim. Anything that I want is behind that door, but that's really what's fundamentally interesting about it is that uh, because the experience is an entire reality that is built completely out of your own mind and your own imagination, no matter what it is that your mind and your imagination are seeking, it is built into the very framework of that reality. So uh, if you are a hedonistic individual and you want to, I don't know, have sex and pleasures and enjoy fun things and uh, that's, that's your goal, then delving into a dimension made of your own imagination is a fantastic way to experience those things as far as your heart's content, because there's nothing that can really, you know, stop you from experiencing those things, uh, if you can just manifest them at whim, right? 
Uh, if you are interested in more of the, the spiritual um, uh, experiences with the divine, you're interested in, um, I don't know, those kinds of things, right? Of course, those kinds of things are in there because they exist in the in the in the way that you are able to uh, connect with them uh, and in many ways deeper than you realized because they are symbols uh, deep within your psyche imagination and motivations as a human being which are also part of that psyche um, so those are there too and um, as far as you know, any, really anything that you could you could possibly try to explore is there. If you're just interested in the pragmatic, you have no interest in the mystic, you might be on the wrong podcast. <laughs> but let's say that you are, that's okay too, you know, because it is a fascinating thing that your brain can do, which is drastically different from everything else that you're experiencing on a regular basis. And it's very fucking interesting to observe. And you can kind of take apart your mind in a way and observe how it's functioning deep, deep, deep below the level that you usually see it operate at. So regardless of what your motivations are in life, lucid dreaming is absolutely the type of thing that I think everyone should be interested in. So why lucid dream? Because it's all behind that door, right? And uh, throughout this, we are going to talk about it as a door because it's kind of a door to a place. And uh, I... You could you can argue that it's not a physical place, but it is a place that you can experience in three dimensions and with a narrative, actually more than three dimensions, but uh, similar to how uh, virtual reality is a kind of a place as far as your mind is concerned, um, even though it's not like a like a uh, it depends on how you define the word real, but it's not a real place. It's not what we would consider to be like a physical reality. Um, it is a place that you experience as if it is real, though. So it's uh, it's interesting, man. Everything's behind that door. Why wouldn't you want a lucid dream? It's insane. So to kind of talk more about the mechanisms, the scientific side of it, what do we know about lucid dreaming? Well, first off, we have medically proven that lucid dreaming exists. Now, obviously, uh, I have personally experienced lucid dreaming, so I, I don't know that I need uh, science to tell me that it is, in fact, the case, because I have had it happen to myself. But it sure helps when trying to talk to other people that haven't had lucid dreaming to be able to explain it is real. It is something that the psychology community, the medical community, has proven in experiment. Uh, published in 1981 was a paper called Lucid Dreaming Verified by Volitional Communication During REM Sleep. And in it, uh, the uh, authors of the paper, uh, and we'll include a link to the paper uh, in the show notes on the website at whitewoodpodcast.com. During, if you go to the episodes section, open up the show notes for this episode, we will include that in there. I always want to make sure that when something is scientific or historic, that we have a citation for it. So uh, while it's really hard to cite a lot of subjective experiences, this is definitely not one of those things that's difficult to cite. And so it will be on the website. Um, but in that paper, they did an experiment trying to verify and validate that an individual was having a lucid dreaming experience and when they were having a lucid dreaming experience. And the way that they did it has to do with why we call it rapid eye movements, why your eyes move in the first place, and kind of those chemicals that we were talking about a little bit ago that paralyze the body. So when you, uh, this is heavily uh, related to sleep paralysis, by the way, and uh, I think that almost deserves its own episode. But um, when you go to sleep, you enter some of those states, your brain releases a chemical that paralyzes you, except for your eyes. And we don't really know why. We don't know why. Is it just a limitation that uh, we just happened to evolve the chemical that didn't bother paralyzing your eyes and it didn't matter for whatever reason? Who knows? We don't know why. But it doesn't paralyze your eyes. Um, there's also no threat of your eyes moving around, rolling around in their sockets as you're sleeping. Uh, and so 
Um, when you have that paralyzed chemical, if you're reacting to the world around you in the dream, let's say there's a bear, you turn, you run away from the bear, your arms and legs are paralyzed and they won't move as if you're running away from the bear. However, your eyes will move exactly how you move in the dream. So if you look to the left in your dream, your eyes will move, look to the left. If you look to the right during a dream, your eyes will move. And that's what causes the sensation, uh, the, the physical trait that we've observed during dreaming called rapid eye movement, which is your eyes moving around as you look around and take in this world around you, right? Uh, so that's one of the physical signs that we can see on the dreamer's body that they are dreaming, the rapid eye movement. So they got real smart in 1981. I mean, it was published in 1981. I, the, the research was done before 1981, but um, so they got real smart with it and they said, hey, what if we utilize that in order to communicate that we're lucid dreaming while it's happening. So what they did was they tried to create a two-way communication street with the dreamer. So the dreamer should, to some level, be kind of aware that they're dreaming if they're lucid. So they should be a little bit aware of the world around them. And then uh, they should be able to, from within the dream, communicate that they are with pre-designated eye movements. For example, I look to the left four times, and then I look to the right four times, and then I look up and down. You know, um, So that's kind of what they did. They took somebody who lucid dreams on a regular basis, but not every night. They did some long research that had to do with which nights they are lucid dreaming, which nights they aren't, and can they get them to produce those eye movements on the nights that they are lucid dreaming, and can they not see those movements on the nights they are not lucid dreaming, and then uh, collect research onto you know, what the body goes through while they're lucid dreaming, um, if that makes sense. So uh, there was some research done, and it's a fantastic paper, and I strongly suggest people take a look at it if you are so inclined to uh, do the incredibly boring task of reading <laughs> medical journals because uh, they're dense material for sure. It's supposed to be, you know, it's it's scientific research and it's uh, it's supposed to be very in depth. And um, I, but some people, uh, rightly so, get kind of frustrated with that kind of information. You know, it's dense. I get it. Um. So we know scientifically that individuals lucid dream from time to time, that it is a real phenomenon. It has been medically proven. Um, what is happening when we're lucid dreaming? What have we been able to figure out about sleep, about what brain activity during sleep and different stages throughout sleep? Are there any patterns to it? We've kind of alluded to the idea that there are some patterns to it. So there's these things called sleep cycles. And so basically, when you're alert and aware, you're in full wakingness, right? You're awake, hopefully right now, listening. Um, then, after you lie down, you start to go to sleep, you go into a specific stage of sleep, and then you transition into another stage of sleep. You transition to another stage of sleep and the brain activity in every single one of these stages is distinct from the brain activity of the other stages we can physically see the brain activity is different in each one of these stages and what happens is you go to sleep and then you go through stage one and then stage two and then stage three and then most importantly stage four which is that REM sleep uh, most importantly for dreaming and lucid dreaming uh, some of those other stages of sleep are extremely important for other reasons so, I'll give you kind of an idea of the stages of sleep. Uh, your stage one is your, well, f before you even really enter anything super interesting, you transition into the hip hypnagogic uh, sleep. The hypnagogic uh, visions are those flashes of images, visions, sounds, smells, ideas, that you might see just in a split second as you are transitioning from awake to asleep. You're not really dreaming, but you might 
if you pay really close attention as you're falling asleep, you might notice that there's a brief period where you get some flashes of images and, and random ideas. Uh, this is what Salvador Dali was painting. Not all of his work, but some of his work. Some of that really weird stuff is because he would take, I think it was a coin in his hand or a spoon in his hand, something along those lines. And uh, he would sit upright in a chair and it was bedtime and he would let himself fall asleep. And when he hit the hypnagogic level, he would drop the spoon because his hand would get relaxed, right? Because he fell asleep. And then it would clang on the floor and he would wake up and because he never went through a stage that wipes your brain's memory, he would remember in vivid detail exactly what he had just seen. And then he would attempt to like write it down and later paint it in order to try to, you know, connect with some of that strangeness that is the hypnagogic uh, visions. I would say the weirdest stuff happens in the hypnagogic. And there are techniques, uh, like liminal dreaming that has to do with exploring the hypnagogic as opposed to exploring the lucid dreaming. You'll find that those are the very strange places there where your brain is almost just misfiring because it's in a transitional period between I'm awake and alert and I'm asleep. So some parts have shut down and it takes time to shut down all of them. And if you can imagine, uh, let's say you're in a giant office building and you have a different employee at each light switch. And you just stand at the bottom of the stairwell and you go, okay, it's time to turn off the lights. As soon as you see some lights get shut off, I want you to shut off some lights. And then you flip the switch, right? Each one of those employees is going to have a different timing where they're going to flip that switch because they're all going to be based on whatever visual cues they have. Some of them might be, you know, looking out the back window and looking at the reflection on the building's windows next to it. And they might see a different timing to start. Some of them might be looking down the hallway and uh, see something down the hallway gets shut down. And so as that happens, as things start to transition into sleep, there's some really weird psychological states that exist that's in between everything's turned on to everything's turned off. And every night that pattern is going to be different because it is part of that random employee turning off his lights process, if that kind of makes sense as an analogy. So that's what a hypnagogic is. That's the very first thing that's going to happen. And then you're going to get into actual sleep, which is broken into four stages. Generally, uh, your stage one sleep is a very, very light sleep. If I was in a stage one sleep and you walked into the room and said, Hey, Nate, I could probably respond to you. Not even, not even, I would definitely wake up. I could probably hold on a conversation with you. You could go, Hey, Nate, I could be like, yeah, what's up? Hey, uh, you remember tomorrow you have a meeting. Okay. I'll remember. Thanks. And that's how lightly you're asleep in stage one sleep. You're not just in stage one at the beginning of the night either. There are some other times throughout the night that you're in stage one. There's kind of an ebb and flow to sleep where you'll go through stage one, two, three, four, and then you'll go back to one and then back to two and then back to three and then back to four and then back to one, two, three, and four. And so, uh, it's not just that first moment that you're falling asleep that you find yourself in stage one sleep. There are some other moments throughout the night. Stage one sleep is uh, not incredibly long. Uh, it's, a, it's a short process. Many, many people uh, only engage it for you know 15 to 20 minutes. And then you'll enter the next set of sleep. Another thing about these patterns as we're talking about the one, two, three, four, and then back to one and back to two, right? Uh, as you're going through that, they're not all the same length. The first uh, time that you go through it is a different length of time than the second time you go through it is a different length than the third time you go through it. So as you go through the night uh, and, and the pattern even changes a little bit. So uh, that's how you get into stage one sleep and, and kind of what that is. Stage two is where you're like, you're like really sleeping. So stage two is uh, also pretty light sleep, but, uh, this is where you start to have like those experiences. If you've ever like felt like you're falling or your body like jolts you awake, it's as your, uh, body starts to be disconnected from everything, um, initially. And, and it's still a pretty light sleep. If you were to wake somebody up from this, much of the brain activity is still going on and they would probably say it wasn't sleeping. They are sleeping. Um, but it's easier to rouse the individual 
from stage two than it is some of the other stages. Stage three is where we find... Um, now, stage three is sometimes divided into multiple stages. Although, before we get too distracted, stage two is very important because of sleep spindles. There's, uh, during this period, there's not a lot of brain activity in stage two sleep, but there's these weird spikes that happen, like electrical spike impulses, and we're not really quite sure what they are. We think they might have something to do with uh, repairing uh, memory pathways, but we're not really sure. So if you uh, read the brainwaves of an individual in stage two sleep, just randomly they'll have these giant spikes of activity and then it'll go back down. Random spike of activity, go back down. And that's like one of the defining characteristics that is uh, stage two sleep is that they're easy to rouse and wake up, but they uh, are having sleep spindles. That's kind of where that starts at. Um, stage three sleep is often broken into two different stages. Sometimes people refer to it as stage three sleep. Sometimes people refer to it as stage three and stage four sleep. And whatever the last stage is, is REM sleep. So in this case, I'm gonna combine three and four, but be aware that if you're like in a college setting, they're probably going to uh, separate out as many different stages as possible. And you'll have sub stages and those kind of things as you explore it. So your main characteristics with three and four, uh, this is your transition into deep sleep and the state of deep sleep. And the things that are happening during the deep sleep are that's when your body starts dividing cells. That's where your body starts releasing growth hormones. That's where your eyes and muscles and your joints and everything just starts to like physically relax. Um, so there's definitely like some repairing of the body that's happening at this stage. But your brain is basically shut off. This is a very interesting point. If you've ever woken up and been confused as to where you were when, when somebody like brought you back, somebody's like, hey, by the way, I need you to wake up. And you're like, what year is it? Am I, oh, I am, I'm a person. Like if you've ever like booted up because someone woke you up and you felt like you were just dead, and now suddenly you're like having trouble gripping what reality you're in. It's because you were in like stage four sleep or stage three, depending on how you want to, how you want to word that you were in the late sleep. So stage three is the transition into deep sleep. And then stage four is deep sleep. So, um, usually I'll just consider them to be one stage. Um, but if you're in that deep sleep, your brain is dead. It is like, there's not a lot going on. And this is a really important point because this is, the sleep stage that wipes your memory. So we talked a little bit about a cycle. This is really important for lucid dreaming. Every time you go through this set of sleep, you forget whatever you've been sleeping about, whatever has been happening in the entire sleep cycle. So we talked about how you can hold a conversation with somebody in sleep stage one. They can be roused in stage two and to tell you that they weren't asleep. They enter stage three to four, and they are such a deep sleep that they forget stage one and stage two. And that's why we consider those stages of sleep as opposed to stages of, you know, drifting off. Is because uh, they literally will forget whatever happened during any part of sleep. They'll remember what happened when they were awake, but not when, what they were happened when they were asleep. So it wipes your mind when you enter stage like that, that deep sleep stage. Now this becomes really complicated because, uh, you dream more than once throughout the night and you don't remember them. Usually you'll remember your very last dream. Um, if you remember dreams at all. And, uh, it can be very complicated to lucid dream in one of those and bring that information back without waking yourself up in order to skip one of those deep sleep cycles. Uh, another thing is that if you, for example, uh, try to keep yourself awake and alert as you fall asleep. So like, let's say I go to sleep and I'm like, I'm going to lucid dream tonight. I'm going to pay attention the whole time that I'm falling asleep and you're awake and you find your, your body going through this other process. And then you enter deep sleep. You're going to forget that you were trying to do that. And you're, you're going to forget how it went <laughs> because those first two stages are going to be wiped clean. Slate is clean. So 
Um, this is our massive barrier with lucid dreaming. This is the thing that stops us from getting into that space is this stage of deep sleep. Um, then finally, REM happens. You make it to the other side of the deep sleep period. The deep sleep is really where you're getting your rest. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for you to feel rested in the morning if you didn't get any deep sleep, right? Because that's where your brain is resting. And so uh, REM sleep is actually coming back up towards brain activity. You're not going so far down that you find a dream. You're going so far down that you get rest. You're coming back up to a lot of brain activity just kind of below the first two forms of sleep. Uh, some might say above stage two sleep because there's a lot of things happening. There's neurons firing, there's pictures going on in your head. There's, you know, there's a dream happening. And so you're actually coming out the other side of that deep and coming back up for more of an experience, more brain activity. Um, REM sleep is where you start dreaming. Now, uh, during REM sleep, your frontal lobe does not usually activate. And that's what we're going to try to trick it to do when we lucid dream. We're going to trick your frontal lobe into turning on so that you can experience the dream itself, if that makes sense. And be uh, aware, alert, using your full mind uh, to process the information, be in control, and use your critical thinking skills. Uh, that's kind of what the process is. So generally speaking, REM sleep does not include that. However, turning that part of your brain on does not end REM sleep. And that is the sweet spot that we're going to kind of shoot for when we're trying to make an individual lucid dream is we are going to uh, get their frontal lobe turned on without waking them up. That's the sweet spot. Um, so then basically what happens is you go through stage one, stage two, stage three and four, and then you're into your REM sleep. And then it starts all over again. You go back to stage one sleep after REM sleep. If you rouse somebody in that, they have that specific stage of recollection happen. If you, uh, if, if you let somebody get into stage two sleep again, you start reading their brain waves, you'll see the sleep spindles all over again. And they'll uh, respond to, you know, about the same. So that's kind of what happens. Then you enter back into that deep sleep your mind is wiped of the dream that you just had, as well as all of the previous things that have happened. You enter that deep sleep of rest, and then another REM cycle happens. And this happens for most people about three times a night. It's pretty clockwork. Your circadian rhythm is pretty clockwork, where um, each, each REM cycle is definitely going to change length. So your first REM happens like after like 90 minutes of being asleep, and it only lasts for like 10 minutes, a very short REM cycle. And each time that you have a REM cycle, it gets longer. So you would, uh, you know, and, and other stages of sleep can, can elongate as well. So your first stages of sleep uh, are much shorter than your last stages of sleep. Now, um, your deep sleep, depending on how tired you are, is optional in your last cycle. And we'll talk about why that's really, really important. So sometimes your brain will give you stage of deep sleep a third time in the night, and sometimes it won't. And uh, so to kind of give you an idea, you're going to go through stage one, two, three, four, REM, one, two, three, four, REM, one, two, skip three and four sometimes, depending on how tired you are, and go straight into REM. So there's a little bit of a, a pattern that occurs throughout the night. And um, throughout the next episode, what we want to talk about is how do we use all of that information in order to get into the dreaming experience? How can we uh, kind of hijack this system to make it do what we want? Thanks for listening to the Whitewood Podcast. This show is made possible by our Patreon members. You can find us on Twitter at Whitewood Show and on Facebook at Whitewood Podcast. For links to all our social media and information about our Patreon, visit us at whitewoodpodcast.com.